Hey there, bio team. We've officially got all of the DNA profiling basics nailed. I mean, we know what DNA profiles are and we know the steps involved in making the types of DNA profiles. Now, if I'm being totally honest with you, you'll never be asked to explain how DNA profiles are made in your exams. Before you all start coming at me with pitchforks, the reason we went through the methods in depth in the last video was to give you a basis of understanding for when it comes to interpreting DNA profiles in different applications. The main applications of DNA profiling we're going to be looking at in this video are in determining parentage, that is someone's biological parents, and to identify an unknown person, usually in a forensic investigation or after a natural disaster. Okie doke, let's get into it. As you probably all know, humans have 23 homologous, or matching, pairs of chromosomes, so 46 chromosomes in total. This is because we inherit our DNA from two parents. We get one set of 23 chromosomes from mum and another 23 from dad, so that we end up with 46 in total. Importantly, each pair of homologous chromosomes codes for the same genes. What this all means is that every person has two alleles, or copies, of every gene in their genome. Except for some on the sex chromosomes, but that's not the point right now. The point is that every person has two copies of each SDR, one from each parent. For example, this person has an allele for SDR1, which has two CGA repeats on the chromosome they got from their mother, and an allele with five CGA repeats on the chromosome they got from their father. Because of this, all of the SDR alleles in a person's DNA profile should also be present in their mother's or father's DNA profiles. Let's look at an example using a DNA profile produced by gel electrophoresis. Now, in the last video, we presented a DNA profile which looks like this. As you can see, each of the SDRs are run in separate wells. But in reality, a scientist would just analyse all of the SDRs in a single reaction by adding lots of the relevant primers to the mix to make a DNA profile more like this. I guess you could say that scientists are just lazy, uh, I mean, smart like that. This shortcut doesn't affect the final result since we're only worried about comparing people's DNA profiles. So here, we have the DNA profiles of a mother, her child, and two potential fathers. Since we know who the mother is, we can assume that the bands in the child's DNA profile which match their mother must have come from her. And then, all of the remaining bands in the child's DNA profile must be present in the father's. Just for the record, we could also use an electropherogram to determine parentage, but the same idea applies. All of the peaks in the child's DNA profile are present in either the mother's or father's DNA profile. So, in summary, in both kinds of DNA profiles, people inherit some of their alleles from each parent, so their DNA profiles consist of a combination of their parents' alleles. Another application of DNA profiling is in the identification of an unknown person. Most commonly, you'll see this applied in forensic investigations, where we want to determine the identity of the person suspected of committing the crime or even the identity of a victim who is otherwise unrecognisable. Alternatively, it can be used to help identify the bodies of people killed in natural disasters, such as earthquakes and tsunamis. In both of these cases, a sample taken from the scene can be used to generate a DNA profile. Then, by comparing this DNA profile to DNA profiles of potential suspects or victims, we can identify the person based on whether the profiles match. Let's look at an example using a DNA profile produced by gel electrophoresis. So we've got four DNA profiles here, one made using DNA from the crime scene and three made using DNA from the top three suspects. To figure out the person who committed the crime, all you need to do is look at the band pattern, so the number of bands and where they are. The person whose DNA profile is a complete match to the one that the crime scene is guilty because the chances are that the DNA samples must have come from the same person, so long as the scientists analyse enough SDRs, of course. I mean, if the shoe fits, wear it. Although, looking at history, I can't say that the same applies to gloves. 
Anyways, keep in mind that the same information could also be presented as an electropherogram. And again, the person with the electropherogram that matches the DNA profile from the scene, so the person with the same number of peaks in the same places, is the one who was there. So this really isn't too bad, hey? Just remember that in identification that the victim or suspect is the person whose DNA profile is a complete match to the DNA profile from the scene. Okay, everyone, let's wrap up. DNA profiles can be used to determine the identity of someone's biological parents. Since people inherit half of their alleles from each parent, their DNA profiles consist of a combination of their parents' alleles. DNA profiles can also be used to identify an unknown person. The victim or suspect is the person whose DNA profile is a complete match to the DNA profile generated using a sample taken from the scene. That's it for this video, everyone. Chat soon.